So um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about uh, Wikipedia, I'm going to talk about Wikia, which is my new project, uh, and I'm going to talk about the, the future of free culture generally and, and uh, some of the things that I see uh, coming down the road uh, on the internet and so forth. Uh, but to kick things off, and then we're going to have questions and answers uh, at the end, so I, and that's actually usually my favorite part because uh, I enjoy getting uh, questions. So. Uh, in 1962, Charles Van Doren, who was later a senior editor at Britannica, said the ideal encyclopedia should be radical. It should stop being safe. But if you know anything about the history of Britannica since 1962, uh, it's been anything but radical. Um, it's still a very uh, safe, uh, very old-fashioned, and very high-quality uh, encyclopedia project. Wikipedia, on the other hand, began with a very radical idea, and that's for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. So that's what we're doing. So this uh, vision statement has several different parts to it that are very important. Um, when we talk about every single person on the planet, um, what this means is that Wikipedia's mission goes far beyond uh, just English. Uh, it goes uh, really all around the world. And in fact, uh, if you think about the number of people who are on the internet versus the number of people who aren't on the internet, uh, there's some interesting questions about um, how do we reach all the people who aren't on the internet? How soon will we be on the internet? What are some of the mechanisms? Uh, given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. So free access is important uh, in, in a very special way. We, we mean uh, free in a very particular sense, not in the sense of, uh, uh, there was an old saying in the free software me movement, uh, we mean free as in speech, not free as in beer. Uh, so free beer is great. Somebody gives you free beer, you drink it. Uh, that's very important. Um, <laughs> That line always does well on college campuses. Um, <laughs> but we, we're talking about something more fundamental, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and the sum of all human knowledge, and the word sum there is very important. Uh, Wikipedia is a, a particular kind of reference work. So uh, what is Wikipedia? So, uh, well, first of all, I, I always love to ask the question, how many people here have used Wikipedia? Which is sort of, okay, pretty good. Uh, but that's actually just a joke question. How many people here have actually edited Wikipedia? So that's actually, that's, that's pretty good too. Um, and um, so a lot of people who've simply used Wikipedia, uh, they may not really have the full idea of what we're all about and, and some of the philosophy and some of the ideas behind Wikipedia. So the, the fundamental definition of Wikipedia is that it is a freely licensed encyclopedia written by thousands of volunteers in many languages. So when I talk about freely licensed and I talk about uh, free access, what am I talking about? Well, I mean free in the sense of GNU, free in the sense of uh, free software, or most people know it as open source software. Uh, so this is the, some of the ideas outlined by Richard Stallman many years ago. Uh, and the idea is that there are four freedoms that we want people to have for all of our work. So you have the freedom to copy it, the freedom to modify it, the freedom to redistribute it, and the freedom to redistribute modified versions. And you can do all of these things commercially or non-commercially. So when people are contributing to Wikipedia, they aren't just contributing to this particular uh, humanitarian project. Uh, they're contributing to a central storehouse of knowledge that people can repurpose and reuse for any purpose they want, uh, for all kinds of different things. Um, and that has a lot of interesting implications, uh, particularly when you reflect on thinking about how do we reach people in the developing world who don't have access to the internet. Uh, a lot of interesting things are starting to happen around that in terms of people going out and distributing Wikipedia on uh, uh, CD-ROM or USB sticks to get it to people who don't have reliable access to the internet. So free access to knowledge is really important and if you go back to written by thousands of volunteers in many languages, uh, this raises the question of how global is Wikipedia? Uh, so uh, of course the English uh, Wikipedia is the largest uh, version of Wikipedia with now uh, just over three million articles. Uh, German Wikipedia is getting very, very close to one million. Uh, they're going to pass one million in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, then we have French, Polish, Japanese, Italian, Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese um, with over 500,000 entries each. Uh, Russian, Swedish, and Chinese have over a quarter million. Uh, it's interesting, though, when you look at this list of languages, um, what you see here is mostly European languages. Um, the, the two exceptions, uh, would, well, three exceptions are Russian, but that's, you know, uh, Japanese and Chinese. Uh, but what we don't see in the top languages are um, a lot of the languages of the developing world for all of the sort of normal reasons that you would expect. So when we look at Norwegian as an example, I chose Norwegian because I'm on my way to Norway and I didn't want to have to make the slide twice. 
Um, but it's actually the next. It's the, it will fa pass 250,000 next. Uh, so in Bokmal, which is one of the languages of Norway, uh, they have 230,000 articles, uh, despite the fact that there are only 4.8 million native speakers uh, of this language. Um, so we can compare that to Hindi. Hindi has just over 50,000 articles, even though there are 280 million speakers of Hindi. So obviously there's a big disparity there. So what are some of the reasons for that disparity? Uh, some of them are fairly obvious. Uh, one, one of them is uh, access to the internet, access to broadband internet. Uh, another one is literacy. A lot of the people who are speaking Hindi aren't necessarily literate or educated. Uh, they aren't on the internet. Um, there are some others. Uh, the, the percentage of people who speak English is actually a positive uh, for the size of a local language Wikipedia, which is sort of interesting. I remember in the early days of Wikipedia, somebody hypothesized that, for example, the Dutch Wikipedia might not ever do very well because so many Dutch people speak perfectly good English. But in fact, the opposite is proven true. Places where English is very high uh, came to Wikipedia earlier, uh, probably they learned of it earlier, and they've been very, very successful. Um, of course, uh, we can't uh, omit mention of the weather because in Norway it's very, very cold. There's nothing else to do in the winter except edit Wikipedia. Um, you know, in India there's lots of things you can do in the evenings, so uh, I'm just joking, but there does seem to be the northern European countries are very, very strong in Wikipedia, so that's kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, the Spaniards are, as you can see, gaining on the Dutch after all this time, so that's uh, sort of interesting. So, uh, so it's a very, very global project, although we still uh, are very interested in and very concerned about how do we promote Wikipedia, how do we get growth in all the languages of the developing world. There are only three languages in Africa uh, that have at least 1,000 entries, um, which is uh, very, very small. And it's for all of these sort of obvious reasons. Uh, we're starting to get some traction there, but there's just a long way to go. So how popular is Wikipedia? Um, we've seen in this room, uh, it's quite popular. Um, but uh, looking around the world, uh, Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website in Germany, uh, sixth most popular in the US, ninth most popular in India, ninth most popular in Japan. Uh, and this last one is interesting, the 14th most popular website in Iran. Uh, one of the things when we think about Iran, a lot of people don't think of it as the kind of place that would embrace the kind of enlightenment values that Wikipedia represents, but it's actually not true. Um, ordinary people everywhere uh, love Wikipedia. Uh, they really like the idea of a uh, neutral source of high quality information. Uh, recently, uh, when the, uh, you know, surrounding the uh, Iranian elections, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of um, uh, unrest there regarding that. And I was very curious to know what was going on in the Farsi uh, Wikipedia. Um, was it uh, going to be neutral? Was it going to be really biased in one direction or the other? Uh, and so I asked someone who's a, a fluent uh, native speaker of Farsi and also a, a fluent native speaker of English to translate the article for me. Now translating is always kind of tricky, but she told me that she was really trying to translate in a very matter of fact and just sort of very uh, plain kind of way without embellishment. Um, and it turned out that the the uh, the Farsi Wikipedia entry about the election uh, was very, very neutral, very bland, just simply stated the basic facts, um, which is exactly what we would hope uh, that Wikipedia could contribute. Um, and this is one of the reasons that is really popular there. So uh, very pleased about that. Now, th these popularity numbers are from Alexa, which is uh, maybe sometimes uh, not such a great source, so I won't really 100% vouch for these, but I think in, they're in the ballpark. Um, so in different countries and different uh, cultures around the world, uh, Wikipedia is very, very similar, but there are some very interesting uh, uh, differences in different places. And I know this is a little small uh, to read, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. This is uh, English, uh, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, Russian, and Spanish. Um, and it's a look at the most popular entries in Wikipedia and what subjects are interesting. Uh, so as you can see, the Japanese have almost no other interest than pop culture, um, which is sort of interesting. Um, the the uh, you know ge geography is a little bit smaller in English and, uh, and than French and German and so on. Um, as you can see, in most places around the world, uh, sex is uh, very popular, uh, except for in France and Spain. Um, somebody said to me that's probably because they're actually having sex. <laughs> And we're all just reading about it. Um, but this is sort of interesting that there, that there is this difference across cultures in what's popular in Wikipedia. And this despite the fact 
uh, that the Wikipedia communities tend to be very similar around the world, uh, and the neutrality seems to be very similar around the world. Uh, but I, I just found this to be quite an, an interesting uh, observation. Uh, so here's another way of looking at the popularity of Wikipedia. Uh, this is actually, this chart's a little bit uh, old. Now these numbers are from Comscore, so this is looking at unique visitors, and this is a few months old. So at this time, we were the fourth most popular uh, website. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation site, so that's Wikipedia and some of our other properties. Um, and then AOL, and what I, we actually went back and forth with AOL for a few months uh, for who was in fourth place, and I always said that I'm sure AOL would pass us permanently soon because they're so innovative. Uh, but in fact, uh, the latest numbers have come out and Facebook has been roaring ahead uh, and Facebook just passed us in terms of the unique visitors. Uh, right now, uh, the last numbers I saw, we were at about 330 million uh, unique visitors a month and Facebook is now, um, I think, 350 or 360 million. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, but our position is secure and we're continuing to grow. Uh, but I think this is a really uh, sort of an amazing thing to think about. So we have this enormous global impact. We're reaching hundreds of millions of people every month. We're in all of these different languages around the world. Um, and yet, the organization behind Wikipedia is quite unique. I mean, when you think about these things, uh, often when I'm talking about Wikipedia, uh, people come up and they, they start asking me questions about the organization, and I don't understand their question at first until I realize they're trying to figure out where the campus is, the big building with 3,000 employees, uh, something like what Google or Yahoo would have. Uh, but in fact, the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, which is the charity that I founded, which runs Wikipedia, um, has a staff of, well, this number's out of date now. We have a staff of about 25 people worldwide. Um, yeah, three more people. I'm afraid we're getting a little bloated, but uh, I think it's okay. So when we think about Wikipedia, the way to think about Wikipedia and who's creating Wikipedia is that there is a huge global volunteer community. Uh, how many people are in the community versus not in the community, of course, that's very difficult to, to answer. But you can imagine, you know, 100,000 active people all around the world who are in some way uh, committed to and contributing to Wikipedia. And this staff, uh, their job is to support all of those people. So uh, we're a very, very tiny organization. Last year, our budget was uh, around $7 million. And for the coming year, our budget's around $10 million. So uh, in the grand scheme of things, compared to the you know, multi-billion dollar corporations that we are uh, ranked with in terms of popularity, we're a very, very different uh, animal. Uh, I have a short video here which shows uh, the office, and I think the sound is working, so here we go. We're going to see what happens. The Wikimedia Foundation is the organization behind Wikipedia and eight sister free information projects. We're a huge, really popular website. We're the number four website in the world, 250 million people using it every month, and we're a nonprofit. It's an amazingly vibrant atmosphere, and I guess the first thing that amazed me when I showed up was just how small the operation is. Most people think that it's a fairly large setup, all sorts of editors, crazy amount of developers and administrators, and really it's not. When I first got hired, I thought I'd be walking into a very large scale company, and I walked in, and at that time it was like five people. So the bulk of what we do and the bulk of the value that's created for the organization, for the projects, is done by volunteers all around the world. Here in the office, there's a staff of 23 people, and what we do is facilitate and support those volunteers in the work that they're trying to get done. There's a volunteer community who are very much a part of the organization. We are the smallest part here in San Francisco. It's, it's much bigger. The knowledge is, is, uh, is freely available for, for a much broader population than it has been in the past. Wikipedia is available in 264 languages. The biggest part of, of my work is to broaden the participation of uh, the Wikipedia language versions. We want to broaden participation. We want to target particular groups and encourage readers in those groups to actually become editors. Uh, we work with thousands and thousands of volunteers, people who, who are not paid to edit Wikipedia, who, who do it with the love of the project. We don't pay people to do that. They're not all in one place. It's a volunteer. It's decentralized all over the world. One thing that a lot of people don't understand is they can edit. 
you know, they can go in and change things. We want to continually work to increase the quality of information in the encyclopedia. The natural reflex now is for people to look stuff up. My first encounter with Wikipedia was obviously doing research. It is the standard bearer for free knowledge, no advertising. I see a common good in the work that I do. We actually see the benefits. It's a global movement and it's free. We're trying to get free information to people everywhere in the world. Cool. Okay, good. So, um, uh, so th this is a pretty remarkable uh, project and it's obviously doing very, very well. Um, and, but my, my vision for the internet and my vision for free culture is uh, really much broader than this. So, uh, the encyclopedia was the start. Um, and if you think about a traditional encyclopedia and its role uh, in culture and what a, a traditional encyclopedia is, a traditional encyclopedia is, uh, so walk into a library and look for the encyclopedia, it's a set of books about this big. Uh, you know, it's normally 25 to 30 volumes, um, you know, A through Z, and it has a certain amount of information. Uh, but the library is actually much, much bigger. Uh, there's a much broader view of the kinds of things that people can come together to collaborate on and build. Uh, so, my new uh, organization is Wikia, uh, and the relationship to Wikipedia is that uh, they're completely separate organizations. Uh, Wikipedia is from 2001, Wikia started in 2004. Uh, Wikipedia is the encyclopedia, and Wikia is the rest of the library. Uh, and at Wikia, we have, instead of a single gigantic English website, we have uh, some 35,000 different wiki communities who are building things, very specialized things, and I'll give you some of the examples of those in a moment. Uh, Wikipedia is a nonprofit, and Wikia is a for-profit company. These are advertising-supported wikis, uh, which enables us, one, to have the money to actually improve the software much faster, uh, but two, it enables us to support a lot of different kinds of communities that don't really fit into the educational and nonprofit uh, kind of uh, framework. So if we look at the comparative growth of Wikia and Wikipedia, uh, it's very interesting to see that it's a very similar kind of pattern. Uh, I think that this pattern emerges naturally because this is about people forming communities. Uh, one of the things that, that you have to realize about the way a wiki community works is that it is a genuine community. People come into a, uh, a community, they meet other people, uh, they make friends, uh, sometimes they make enemies, which is sometimes as much fun as making a friend. And uh, those kinds of things take time. Uh, genuine communities take time to come together to figure out what it is they want to accomplish. Uh, and so that sort of grows up, uh, comes out in this natural uh, sort of growth rate. So the idea of Wikia is the rest of the library. So we have 35,000 different wikis. Uh, we're in 168 different languages now. Um, I would say 169, but I don't count Klingon as a real language. We do have a couple of lang uh, sites written in Klingon, which I understand doesn't have a past tense, which makes it a little hard to write uh, in Klingon, but they're plugging away. Um, and so, but all of these communities are, are related by the fact that they're creating information with enduring value. It may not be encyclopedia content, uh, but it's other kinds of things. So Wikia, um, our traffic has been growing a lot, uh, even though probably most people have not heard of Wikia. Um, our traffic is now, uh, we've just... Uh, uh, well, we're neck and neck with the New York Times. I just, I, I, uh, we, they've actually had a little spike up, so today I don't think we're ahead of the New York Times, but we're in the ballpark of the traffic of the New York Times in terms of daily page views, which is pretty amazing. So uh, it's interesting to think about what is going on on the internet. What is happening with uh, free culture? What is happening with um, consumer-generated media? And what's happening is that consumer-generated media is becoming dominant. Uh, so here is, uh, I did a search at Google for the keyword Muppet uh, to try to see what is being produced on the internet. And what's interesting here is that in this, uh, on this particular day when I searched, in the top list of links, there is absolutely nothing official. There is no top-down media of any kind. The official website, you can barely even find it. The number one link is uh, Wikipedia, of course. Um, the second link is the Muppet Central fan site. Uh, this is a, a message board where people are posting thousands and thousands of messages about the Muppets 24 hours a day. Um, we have uh, not one, but uh, two links to the Muppet Wiki, which is a Wikia site. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later. Uh, we have the video results. And the video results are sometimes, uh, you know, they're from YouTube and, and they are 
not necessarily, sometimes they're official, sometimes they're parodies. Uh, it varies what, what uh, Google links to. But they're all being drawn from uh, blogs and fan sites for the most part where people are discussing the Muppets or there's a conversation about the Muppets. Uh, we have the Muppet News Flash, which is a blog about the Muppets. Um, so in this whole top group of sites, um, they're, all, uh, they're all communities, they're all uh, consumer generated. Uh, the Muppet Wiki here uh, is uh, a really great wiki and they have written 18,935 articles about the Muppets. <laughs> you know, what are they doing? Uh, do they have jobs? Uh, well, it turns out a lot of them do have jobs. They just also have this passion for the Muppets. And, and keep in mind, this is not 18,000 message board posts. This is 18,000 uh, entries, uh, some long, some short, most edited by more than one person. But these are very much entries, uh, very similar to what you would find in a Wikipedia entry. So what is different about Wikia uh, versus Wikipedia? How is, why is this stuff all not in, in Wikipedia? Well, if we look at the entry uh, in Wikipedia about the Ford Motor Company, um, it's very much uh, what you would expect from Wikipedia. Uh, it tells the history of the company, it tells uh, about the current management and sales, uh, pretty much all of the things that you would expect to find out about the Ford Motor Company. Although this entry, for reasons that are maybe mysterious to some people, uh, completely fails to mention the time when Kermit was on a commercial. Um, but this is the only thing the Muppet people care about. For them, the Ford Motor Company uh, is pretty much only represented by the fact that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the famous uh, Kermit has a song, It's Not Easy Being Green. Uh, it turns out it is easy being green, you just have to buy a Ford hybrid SUV. Um, so who knew? But what's interesting here is, in, this is in, uh, in 2006, there was also an earlier thing, if you go further down. Uh, but they've really researched this, and so what we're seeing in this particular wiki is uh, people who are looking at one very broad uh, uh, pop culture franchise and they're thinking about how does this intersect um, with the rest of the world? Uh, how does this intersect with everything in the world? Um, and so they're coming up with something. If you try to put this picture into the English language Wikipedia, I think you would be blocked in about 15 seconds, right? Because for Wikipedia, the purpose of Wikipedia is to document very serious information about the Ford Motor Company. It's a very different purpose than what's going on here. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting when we think about free culture, when we think about participatory culture and the things that are happening here, we often think about the internet uh, really in terms of how is the new competing with or replacing the old. So we think about how do uh, political bloggers uh, compete with the editorial page of the New York Times. We think about how does Wikipedia compete with Britannica. Um, but what we're seeing here is something entirely new, something very different. Um, there has never before existed, I mean, if you go to, to Amazon or to Barnes & Noble or any major bookstore and you look for books about the Muppets, there's a lot of books about the Muppets, some of them official, some of them unofficial, but there has never existed uh, an encyclopedia about the intersection of Muppets with the rest of the world with 18,000 entries. We never had an economic model that could sustain that kind of work. There was passion for these kinds of topics, uh, but now we have a tool that's allowing people for the first time to create new types of reference works that we never even imagined could have existed before. If you tried to produce something like this in a top-down manner, uh, trust me, you really couldn't. I mean, it would, it would cost you a fortune and there would be no way to recoup your money. But when you have a community who comes together and says, hey, let's create something really amazing and really cool, uh, they can do this kind of thing. So we have all kinds of things like um, Lostpedia, which is about the TV show Lost. Um, fabulous show. Um, I actually uh, had the opportunity to meet J.J. Uh, Abrams, who's the creator of Lost, um, and he's like, oh my god, I love Lostpedia. And at this time, we didn't own it, so I was like, oh yeah, it's really great, and I had to go out and buy it. But, um, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, and, and in fact, we've had situations, so some of our very popular sites are about video games. We've had situations where we found out, uh, incidentally, uh, that the video game developers are actually relying on the community lore and culture from the wiki uh, to develop the new versions of the game. So there was a case where in one of our wikis uh, there was a character in the game that didn't really have a name and so they just sort of gave him a name so they could refer to him. Uh, in the next version of the game, that was his name. And so that's how we sort of knew the developers were looking at it. We have like the World of Warcraft wiki. Do, does, does anybody here play World of Warcraft? 
Does anybody admit it? Come on. <laughs> Uh, so Warcraft, I mean, this is a, a game with, um, I think, like 11 million players. Um, so I think more than the three people who raised their hand probably have played Warcraft in this room. Uh, so it's a huge thing, and there's, there's the WoW Wiki, and WoW Wiki, which is all about the world of Warcraft, uh, they've written more than 70,000 articles. And some of them are just documenting the game, walkthroughs and things like this, but a lot of it is documenting the culture within the game, documenting different guilds and groups within the game. And so it's really amazing kinds of things that really we have no other way of creating. So my next point is one, there's a particular term that people are using for this kind of thing, uh, and I think it's horrible. The word crowdsourcing. I think crowdsourcing is a term that we should banish uh, because I think that it, uh, it is a misunderstanding of what's going on. And I think that companies and organizations that think about what's going on in terms of crowdsourcing are going to make huge mistakes and big blunders because they don't really get what's going on. It isn't crowdsourcing. Uh, the terminology of crowdsourcing, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a new term that's coined based on the idea of outsourcing. So the idea of outsourcing is uh, we can't afford to hire uh, expensive engineers in California, so we're going to hire cheaper ones uh, in India or somewhere like this. We're going to outsource certain parts of our work to India. It's about finding the cheapest labor. And crowdsourcing, the idea of the, the crowdsourcing is, gee, we have certain work we need to, to have done. Uh, let's trick the public into doing it for free somehow. Uh, and I think that when people approach it in this way, they're making a huge mistake. Uh, and I think it really is an offensive term for people in the communities who are doing things. Uh, so what's wrong with it? So imagine that you're running a bowling alley. I see a few people have seen the movie. Uh, imagine that you're running a bowling alley and you imagine that what you're doing there is that you've got a certain amount of bowling that needs to be accomplished and uh, you're trying to get people to do the work of bowling uh, for free. So you're, you're deeply confused about what business you're in. You're deeply confused about what you're doing. Um, and this is where you get a lot of uh, very strange sort of comments in the press. People will say, gee, why do people work for free for Wikipedia? Some people get paid a lot of money uh, to write. So why are people doing this work for free? That's a lot like asking, gee, you know, I read about this guy who makes a million dollars a year as a professional bowler. Can you tell me how you get people to do this work for free? That's a stupid thing to ask, obviously, right? People do bowling because it's a fun activity. And if you're, if you're running a bowling alley and you think that what you're trying to do is get people to do work for free, you've totally misunderstood what's going on. Instead, you should say, what I'm doing is I'm providing a, a place, a clean, well-lighted place, uh, where people can come with their friends. Uh, we have good beer and bad hot dogs. Um, you can bowl. Uh, it's a community. A lot of bowling alleys really are thriving, uh, the ones that are thriving. It's kind of getting to be an outdated sport, I guess, these days. But they're very community-oriented. They run leagues so that different groups of people can get together and play and organize tournaments and things like this. They're very aware that their job is to facilitate a community who wants to have some fun and do the things they want to do. So this is my view. Um, we're not trying at Wikipedia or Wikia, we don't think, oh, well, there's some work we need doing. Let's try and make it uh, so the public will do it for us. Instead, we say, uh, what are the things that a community could do? What are the things that people really want to do, but they don't have the tools that they need to accomplish what they want to accomplish? And I think by approaching it in that way, we're far more successful um, at meeting people's actual needs and, and getting things accomplished. So finally, I want to close um, with a little bit of the philosophy uh, behind wikis and behind Wikipedia. Um, and what I really want to talk about is this, the, the ideas of openness. Um, why do I believe so much in, in this kind of open model? Uh, there's all these questions about trust and vandalism, and, and what do we think about that? So I want you to all to imagine that you've uh, been assigned the task of, uh, it's a design task, and you've been asked to design a restaurant. So you're going to design a restaurant, and you are thinking about it from scratch. Uh, you, can, you can do anything you want. Uh, I want you to, you know, blank sheet of paper, imagine how to design the restaurant. And so you think to yourself, okay, well, in my restaurant, I know we're going to be serving steak. And uh, if we're serving steak, then I know that the customers are going to need to have access to knives. Um, and if there's anything that we know about customers with knives is that they might stab people. <laughs> so therefore, we'd better put everybody in a cage. So in my restaurant, I'm going to put a cage around every table so that everybody's safe. But well, we all laugh at this, right? We know that this kind of thinking makes a bad society. This is not how we think about restaurant design, even though 
Uh, it actually is true that if you let people have access to knives, it happens very rarely that uh, people will stab each other. Uh, there's a small minority of people who do something bad. But what do we do about this in, in society generally? The way we deal with this is not by thinking in, in terms of um, a gatekeeper model. We don't say, uh, well, you know, before we give you your knife, uh, you're going to have to, you know, be in a cage. Uh, instead, we, we say we've evolved uh, customs and institutions to deal with problems after they arise. So what happens in reality if somebody uh, comes into a restaurant and they have a knife and they start to stab somebody? Um, well, we have certain, uh, first of all, certain social norms about what's supposed to happen next. Uh, one of the things that happens is that, um, well, like this guy here, he's a big guy in the front row, and he's going to hopefully jump up and tackle the person, and if he does, we say, that's very heroic, and we thank you, you're very brave because uh, you're a big guy and you can knock him down. Um, Somebody else uh, is calling the police and calling for an ambulance. So we have the institutions of the, the police and the jails and the prison system to deal with the bad person. Uh, the ambulance is so that whatever bad thing has happened, um, we do our best to try to correct it. Uh, you know, we're going to say, let's sew the person up. And you know what? Sometimes this doesn't work. Tragedies do happen, and that's a cost. But it's a cost that we accept. We say we would rather live in a society where people sit next to each other in a restaurant and generally trust each other, um, even though occasionally bad people do bad things, then uh, that's preferable to living in a society where um, everything is a priori has to be checked and, and nobody is trusted. This is one of the reasons that um, airports are so uh, sort of inhuman and unpleasant because you walk into an airport and they treat you like you're a criminal um, and it generates a very negative feeling. We don't want that in society. Unfortunately, on the internet, when people think about design of social spaces, it's all too easy to fall into the trap of thinking, uh, gee, I'm going to think first of all of the bad things people might do, and I'm going to design my system around that. I want to make sure that nothing bad can possibly happen, and so I need all these permission models and controls and who's authorized to do what. But in so doing, we eliminate the possibility for the, all kinds of normal human action, all kinds of simple kindnesses and people helping each other, because it's very difficult to design systems of security that don't interfere with systems of kindness. So my belief is, when we're thinking about uh, design on the internet, we should think in this open manner. We should think about how do we design social institutions and norms to correct and minimize the problems that are inevitably going to happen. Um, and well, fortunately, on the internet, um, it's digital, so you can, you know, if someone, uh, it's not like getting stabbed, right? You can always revert back. You can always change things back. Uh, there are some harms that can happen on the internet that can't be easily corrected, but that's part of the price of living in an open society, and I think it's worthwhile. So uh, that's the end of my prepared remarks, so thank you very much. And um, now we have uh, plenty of time for uh, open questions, and I can take questions. Uh, Jim, can you tell me what in the eight years might be the most surprising criticism you've received for Wikipedia? And uh, what do you foresee as some of the uh, um, counter arguments to some of the critics of open, uh, open media? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of... Uh, criticisms that are surprising in some fashion. Uh, I guess uh, one that uh, eternally surprises me, although it shouldn't, um, is uh, there, the, there is this story arc in the press that they just simply cannot resist, um, which is uh, a story that says, uh, the headline always says, uh, Wikipedia imposes new restrictions. And it doesn't matter what policy changes we make, that's the interpretation. So uh, several years ago, uh, what we used to do is we, we only had one tool for dealing with uh, persistent vandalism or a problem in an article, which was to protect it. So we would lock the article. And when it's locked, no one can edit it except for the administrators who, by custom, don't edit while it's locked. And so we said, well, we don't like this. That's really a bit too harsh and too strong. In many cases, um, it would be sufficient if we could just prevent certain people. So we, we, we invented something called semi-protection. When an article is semi-protected, anonymous IP numbers can't edit. You have to create an account, and you have to have your account for four days, and then you're able to edit it. So this was a step towards saying, look, we want to open it up. We want to have a lot more people allowed to edit um, rather than having to lock things down like this. Well, as soon as we introduced semi-protection, the headline was, Wikipedia introduces uh, new page controls, right, and restrictions. So now we're moving to a system of, we call it flag protection or flag revisions, um, where instead of those early people who are, you know, new in the community, instead of not being able to edit at all, we're now allowing them to edit at all. 
uh, to edit the articles, but somebody more experienced in the community will review their edits. This has been interpreted in the press as Wikipedia, you know, boards of senior editors will now review contributions from newcomers, or they don't even say newcomers, but you know, contributions. So that's bizarre to me, right? It's like people can't get their minds around the idea that quite possibly uh, the openness actually works and that yes, of course, we're always learning and trying to tweak the model, but that the, the possible advances in how to manage the community and how to give the community the tools to manage themselves aren't always about introducing gatekeeping. So that's kind of a surprising thing, although I should get used to it eventually. Um, how do I answer some of the different criticisms? I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, sometimes there are criticisms which are unfair, and some of them are fair. So um, if uh, somebody vandalizes Wikipedia uh, and something, you know, some insult is in Wikipedia for one minute, uh, and then a reporter happens to notice it and runs a story about it, I say, you know, that's a little bit unfair, right? It's not, it's vandalism with Wikipedia, get used to it. It sometimes will happen. Um, and other times, you know, if we have a, an error that persists for several months, I think that's a legitimate thing to criticize us for. So I, you know, uh, and my answer to that is, well, uh, we're trying to develop better tools. Uh, so give the community the tools they need to be able to manage things. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my answer. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak on the influence of Wikipedia on academic publishing or the future of academic publishing in the world of Wikipedia? Mm. So I think, um, I think the influence of Wikipedia on the world of academic publishing is very, very small at this point uh, and probably will remain so. I mean, we're an encyclopedia, which is a very, very different thing from a peer-reviewed academic journal. Um, and we're not trying to be a peer-reviewed academic journal and I think we shouldn't be. At the same time, there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on uh, in the world of peer-reviewed academic uh, journals as uh, there is a very broad open access movement uh, where people are very interested in saying uh, that the products of academic research should be freely and very widely available. That's a very um, a scholarly idea of what academic research should be about. Um, and it's also, it's an interesting uh, thing that the business model of traditional academic journals uh, is, you know, the, the people who are writing don't get paid, uh, the people who are reviewing don't get paid, and the journals cost a lot of money. Um, that sounds like a vulnerable business model to me. On the other hand, oh, I love this. Everybody turn around and look. Citation needed. That's a very good XKCD. Come up afterwards and we'll get a picture with that because I love it. Um, <laughs> So, uh, at the same time, um, the, the, the function that traditional academic journals play is an important function. And so thinking about, as a lot of academics are thinking about, how do we uh, replace that function? How do we have a system of peer review that doesn't involve that bottleneck, which is a very expensive bottleneck, particularly for people, say, in the developing world, um, who uh, really have a very difficult time accessing the most recent academic research because they can't afford the journals. There are some, there's some progress being made in that area. Uh, one of the projects that I think is worth taking a look at is PLOS One. So this is Public Library of Science, and they have uh, a system PLOS One, which is an online uh, peer review mechanism that I hear is going pretty well, but they're still exploring and figuring out how to make it better. So I think that um, academic research is changing, um, academic publishing, I should say, is changing, um, and it's, it's, I, think that's, I think there's good progress being made in that area. If you're interested in open access at Yale, come talk to me afterwards. Um, let's get one back here. Hi. Um, I'm very interested in um, this idea of openness as a way to affect kind of a, a social change. And I think that, you know, the Wikipedia model has revolutionized the way we distribute knowledge. What other or areas of life is, do you see technology and openness affecting that are, that are outside of this realm of knowledge? Um, so I guess one of the, one of the areas is uh, open access uh, publishing in academics, which we just discussed. Uh, another area uh, w that I think is really, really important is um, uh, free licensing and free access to uh, information produced by the government. Um, and so uh, the U.S., for the most part, is one of the leaders in this because for, um, you know, 
and under U.S. law, anything that's produced by the U.S. government is automatically in the public domain, which is a really wonderful thing. That's not true in many countries around the world. Um, and I think that's been really important. So any kind of reports produced by the Department of Agriculture and things like that, it's in the public domain. People can take it and repurpose it and do different things with it. I feel like that needs to be extended in a lot of ways. So one of the things that happens today uh, is that we see funding for academic research in the form of a grant. So I, I'll give you a classic example. I, I read about, I, there was a grant uh, for the production of an encyclopedia of um, uh, Vir poets in Virginia, right? A very narrow subject. And I think it was even sort of in the 1800s, right? A very narrow three-volume work. Um, and this was supported by a government grant. And the question of whether the government should be supporting that sort of thing or not is an interesting one that i you know, not going to go into. But I will say, if the taxpayers paid for it, it should be freely available. Um, and what's the, the terrible irony of this is that those articles were written very diligently by very qualified people. Uh, the books were sent out, uh, bought by, you know, I don't know how many, a couple hundred academic libraries, and they're sitting on a shelf getting dusty today, and nobody's reading it. Whereas if that information had been under a free license, the Wikipedia community could have made it easily available to the entire world. And if we as taxpayers are paying for that kind of research, uh, shouldn't we expect that it be distributed in the most efficient manner, and a free license is the right way to do that? Um, there's a, a lot of other things that are interesting going on. Uh, there are a lot of really good people now in the Obama administration who are really pushing for um, a lot more sort of open distribution of just raw data sets and things like this. There's a lot of information that's locked up in the government, not for any ideological reason, but just because this is a new way of thinking. Uh, they think, oh, we've got all this raw data, but we're going to somehow process it and make a report. And they don't think of just like, yeah, put all your data online and let anybody who wants to come and download it and do interesting things with it. So I think that's an important area um, where we're going to see a lot of progress uh, because of these ideas of openness. Uh, I guess there's a lot of other areas, you know, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, how did you come to, like, uh, meet your co-founder for Wikipedia? Um, what, what did the, um, you know, that relationship bring to the, you know, the beginning of the, the organization and where did he go? Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I had known Larry uh, from the internet for some time uh, and when I had the idea to have a free encyclopedia for everyone, I contacted him uh, and then I hired him to work for me as the editor-in-chief of Newpedia uh, and that was what we called the first project. Uh, Larry and I had a lot of discussions and debates about, you know, how to do things, and it was a very interesting uh, sort of exchange. Uh, and what we ended up with was that we designed a very top-down system, a very hierarchical system. There was a seven-stage review process. Uh, I remember um, he was having people fax in their, uh, their resume uh, to show that they were qualified to write an article. Well, at the time, that seemed like the only reasonable approach. I mean, we felt like we wanted our project to be respectable, and we knew that if it was coming from the crazy internet, we needed to take extra steps to make it respectable. So that seemed reasonable at the time. Turns out it was a complete failure. Uh, one of the reasons it was a failure is that for volunteers uh, who want to contribute, uh, it was a very intimidating system. So after spending a lot of money on this, and I was getting very frustrated because we weren't having any progress, I decided to write an article myself. And I had been an academic, uh, I was working on a PhD in finance, and I had published a paper on option pricing theory, very mathematical uh, field. And Robert Merton had recently won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work in option pricing theory. And I thought, eh, I can write a five paragraph biography of this guy, right? I had been out of academia for a few years. Um, and, but I was, you know, I, I knew his work and I thought I can do this. And I sat down to write the article and I was like super intimidated because I knew that when I submitted my first draft, they were going to take it and send it out for review, not just to two random finance professors somewhere, but the most prestigious ones they could find. And they were going to give me comments on the article and I was going to have to revise it. And it was like, you know, it was like grad school all over again. It wasn't very fun. It was very intimidating. And so I had a bit of writer's block. I couldn't do it. Uh, and that was when I realized, like, this really isn't going to work. Uh, so then we stumbled across the wiki editing concept. And the wiki editing model had been around since 1995. And um, 
So I downloaded the wiki software and installed it, and um, we started, you know, we, we told the Newpedia community, hey, we've got this new tool, come and take a look at it. And we got more work done in two weeks' time uh, than we had done in almost two years. I mean, it was really remarkable that we had this community of people who were very excited about this idea, this vision of a free encyclopedia, but they were very frustrated by the system. Uh, so after that, you know, uh, there was, it's just a long, long process. Uh, Larry eventually, um, I won't speak for his reasons, but he became dissatisfied with the project and moved on and uh, started a, a, maybe you call it competing project called Citizendium, uh, where uh, instead of, ha is, is sort of a, more of a hybrid. Uh, basically, everybody was gonna have to have uh, some kind of credentials and basically use their real name and be authorized to do things, but it was still gonna use the wiki for the editing process. Uh, Citizendium has not been particularly successful, although there's a community there still working, and I know Larry just announced uh, that he's leaving Citizendium, so I'm not really sure what he's doing today. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Hey, uh, I was wondering, have you ever edited your own Wikipedia page? And alternatively, have you ever been surprised to find the Wikia on something you were searching for an answer for? Surprised to find what? Like a Wiki on something you were looking for. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I have edited my Wikipedia page years ago. Uh, I edited openly under my own name. Uh, and within the community, this was not considered controversial. Um, but the press noticed it and sort of said, ooh, big scandal. You know, said I was caught editing my entry. I'm like, how was I caught? <laughs> yeah, I edited it under my own name. Um, but I decided I shouldn't do that anymore. And, uh, um, yeah, so in general, we recommend to people today that they not edit their own entry and also to not edit anything that you might conceivably have a conflict of interest about. There are some exceptions to that. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's more of a guideline. Uh, simple exception would be, uh, you know, if your date of birth is wrong or your, and assuming your date of birth is not controversial. Um, <laughs> there used to be a section in my entry called uh, date of birth controversy because I was born on a certain day, uh, but my birth certificate says the next day because the doctor must have been very sleepy and made an error because I was born very late at night. So legal documents say a different thing from what my mom tells me. I trust my mom. <laughs> Other people say she's not a reliable source, so. <laughs> no, but in general, you know, things like the address or the location of a company, things like that, of course, a company could come in and edit if it's uncontroversial, you know. Uh, you know, somebody, uh, you know, the CEO left and you have a new CEO and it's just an update. But in general, we tell people, you know, go to the discussion page and post there. Uh, and really, it's more respectful of the community to do it that way. The second question, have I ever been surprised that there was a wiki uh, about a certain topic that I searched for? Um, no, not really. Not anymore, especially. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I'm more surprised if there's not an entry about something, uh, you know, because Wikipedia is very, very comprehensive. Um, I mean, I was surprised. I, I, Remember, uh, there, there's some really humorous uh, entries in Wikipedia. Uh, one of my favorite ones is called uh, Inherently Funny Words. Um, and the story of this is somebody created it, I believe, almost as a joke, right? Uh, but then people, you know, it was almost deleted because people said it's a joke. But it turns out that a lot of famous comedians have talked about this concept that when you're telling a joke or you're saying something humorous, uh, that your specific word choices can be very funny. And you, there's Jerry Seinfeld's talk about it, Woody Allen, Krusty the Clown from The Simpsons has talked about it. Um, and so then somebody went through, and the article was just a mess with people inserting all kinds of random uh, things that they thought were funny. Um, <laughs> And somebody said, no, this could be a good article, but we have to cite our sources. And so somebody went through the article and very, very firmly said, no, we have to have a specific source of a well-known comedian who talked about this concept and what they had to say about it before we add uh, this word to the list of inherently funny words. Uh, and so it became a pretty good uh, article after that. So, you know, so it's things like badger. <laughs> See, it's true. It's an inherently funny word. Okay, so that, that was sort of surprising, I guess, to find that. Hi, uh, so um, what, what do you see in the future of uh, Wikipedia and Wikiad and also uh, in, um, 
more general terms uh, where you see in the future that user generate contents on the internet will it become the mainstream or even the you know only uh, only thing that's uh, prospering can you elaborate on that so uh, when I think about the future of Wikipedia in particular uh, the main thing that I'm focused on is the growth of Wikipedia in the developing world uh, so in a lot of the the languages of India for example uh, we're experiencing uh, as much as 10% monthly growth in the number of entries. Uh, right now, there's about more than 1 billion people online, but it's like 1.1 billion people online, depending on who says and how you measure it. But in the next five to 10 years, we expect to have the next billion people come online. And they're not going to be coming online from Europe, the US, and Japan. Uh, they're going to be coming online in China, in India, Africa, South America. Uh, and I think that's going to have a huge cultural impact as all of those people are coming on and beginning to interact with the global community in a new way. So I think of the future of Wikipedia in those terms. Broadly, or speaking more broadly, uh, I think that Wikia is probably not going to be as popular as Wikipedia. Maybe it will someday. Uh, but it's going to be a lot bigger than Wikipedia because uh, instead of having one entry on the Ford Motor Company, we're going to have hundreds of entries on the Ford Motor Company um, as considered from many different perspectives. You know, Encyclopedia is a parody of Wikipedia and it's going to have a funny article about Ford. The Muppet Wiki has an article about Ford, you know, is it, like all the other books in the library. And then th talking about all user-generated content, I think that uh, in terms of participatory culture, which is what I'm more interested in than simply user-generated, but thinking about how communities are coming together to do things and build things, I'm really interested in what's going on in video, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things happen there um, with groups of people coming together, uh, probably not so much in a broad, giant collaboration like Wikipedia, more in small teams like the way that open source software is done uh, to create, uh, you know, new forms of video art and content, but I, and, and I'm thinking really popular stuff too. I'm not just saying, you know, small groups of people doing sort of quirky art videos is interesting, uh, but what I'm more interested in is are we going to see a situation in 15 years where there's going to emerge a certain folk culture um, so that the, the, at the you know, that the, the, the Harry Potter of 2025, instead of being a single author who wrote this thing that became a large franchise, that instead it emerges in a, in a collaboration with a lot of people online. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm very interested to see if that can happen. And I've seen some really uh, interesting and amazing projects um, already where people are producing uh, you know, film that's actually very impressive quality, um, either animation or live film. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting things that are going to happen there. So maybe one more question here on the end of the row. Two more, so, okay. Sometimes when I start doing preliminary research, I'll look at a Wikipedia article and then I'll go to another website and it's the exact same wording. Uh -huh. And it's always unclear which website had that wording first, but I was wondering if you see this as plagiarism or just an effective use of open source knowledge. So uh, if we copied something directly from another website, I think that's plagiarism and it's very, very, very bad and we frown on that very, very much. Um, one of the things that we're really, is really important to the Wikipedia community, it's not just policing for copyright violations, but it's actually it's a broader ethical point than copyright, which is a specific legal point. Um, it's when people look at Wikipedia, whatever criticism people might have of Wikipedia, we can stand up and say with pride, we made it ourselves. Uh, nobody's ever going to say of Wikipedia, yeah, it's pretty good, that's just because they ganked everything out of Britannica, right? Uh, not true. So we don't like to see that. If somebody is taking content from Wikipedia, uh, the main thing that we would ask is that they respect our license, the Creative Commons license that it's under, which is attribution share alike. So we would say, attribution, you need to say where you got it from, you're allowed to modify it or whatever, and you need to make sure that your version is also posted under that license, that other people are allowed to copy it. Uh, on the other hand, if people just copy it without attribution and so on, it's not good, but we don't get too wound up about it. I mean, some people in the community get very wound up about it, but I personally think, you know, it's bad, but whatever. I've got more important things to do than yell at people for copying Wikipedia, so. Okay, and so now one more question. Where's the microphone? Oh. So uh, in your speech, you talked a lot about the community. Yes. I just have a question. Do you really think that uh, the aggregate knowledge from a community is better than the knowledge produced by a single expert? And also, 
has uh, any event since the founding of Wikipedia upset you about you know, your optimism about the power of community and how have you sustained your faith in that? Um, so I think that, uh, I think that I have to be very careful in answering this question because I think my position is a little bit nuanced. Uh, I think that for creating an encyclopedia article, a collaborative community approach is superior to a single expert. And the reason is an encyclopedia article should not be um, innovative original research. That's not what an encyclopedia article is. So if we imagine, for example, um, a, uh, uh, let's say that the history of psychology as written by B.F. Skinner or Sigmund Freud, two very different giants in the field with a very different view of the world, in my opinion, it's more likely than not that a review of psychology written by B.F. Skinner um, is going to be a remarkable historical document that is very valuable, but is not, in fact, what I want from an encyclopedia article. What I want is a neutral presentation where there's been a lot of give and take and dialogue about what should go in there um, by people who are very thoughtful and knowledgeable. Um, and so in a case like that, I would say yes. On the other hand, if you're talking about um, uh, writing uh, a fabulous novel or a poem, uh, which is an, you know, another form of knowledge about the world, I don't see collaboration as necessarily the best approach. If you're talking about uh, an editorial opinion, uh, I really want a strong individual personal voice there of someone who will stand behind that opinion, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I think it really depends on the specific domain and what you're particularly trying to accomplish. Um, has there any, been anything that really sort of shook my faith in the power of community? And I'm going to say basically no. I mean, there have been times when I've been very frustrated by what some individual moron is doing. Uh, but in general, the Wikipedia community has generally always come to the right conclusions, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, certainly I may disagree about this or that particular decision that gets made. Uh, but in general, I would say if you get together a, a decent sized group of thoughtful people, uh, they end up making pretty good decisions. Um, and this is one of the things that I think a lot of people who aren't part of the Wikipedia world don't really understand. They think of Wikipedia as a complete anarchy with all kinds of crazy things going on, when in fact, it's really, it's a community of people. And, and you know, when you think about things like, um, let's say, uh, the naming conventions for things. I, I was, for a while I was on a, on a mailing list of news librarians. I don't know how I got on it, but I was on a mailing list of news librarians. And they were discussing uh, before the uh, Winter Olympics, I guess it was, in Turin or Torino. They were saying, what are, you, what are your newspapers calling it? Turin or Torino? Uh, because it's kind of changing over time as to which name to use. And I thought, gee, I wonder what Wikipedia does. And what I went, I went and found the, the entry, uh, not in, in, but in the style guidelines, about the question of naming conventions for cities and different places. And I could, just as anybody might, quibble with this or that point. But in general, I thought, wow, I mean, I can't believe that we've got this enormous document with a very nuanced discussion of when and why you would name something using the traditional name as it's known in English or use a more local name. And it's a really thoughtful discussion that's very hard to think of this as like crazy random people doing wrong things, even if you don't agree with the particular decision. So in general, I mean, I think that part of things really works very well. So I guess we're out of time. So thank you everyone yeah. for coming. And I hope that I hope that you will all uh, consider the invitation to get involved with uh, Free Culture Group uh, here at Yale. A lot of these groups are doing a really interesting things at different universities, and the most important thing is it's a lot of fun. So, so and I believe. Please